was just said about what I'll be doing today isn't actually true. I won't be talking about most recent results or anything of that nature. I'll be providing a lecture I gave at Scripps a few months ago for the 50th year anniversary of plate tectonics. And this is on behalf of Richard Hay. Some of you may, here may know him. I know Gary does. Um, and basically, this uh, presentation was put together by John Slater at Scripps, bringing back Scripps alumni and other personnel from Scripps to have a, a, a little celebration of making 50 years past plate tectonics. The people in uh, Richard Hayes' plate tectonics lab at Scripps were Marty Kleinrock, myself, David Caress, and Mike Keeler. He was our programmer. Um, and Richard Hayes worked with many other students, of course, but this was a, a snapshot of time in, when we were at Scripps. Does this? Yes. But I'll digress real quickly. Yesterday was an exciting day for the college and the School of Geosciences. Uh, Tim Dixon and folks from the SCAMP group and uh, uh, Bob Weisberg's group went to Egmont Key, which is this little red square here, this little green island, and deployed this big, large 65-foot pogo stick. It's really a uh, geodetic equipment that is going to uh, be used in Costa Rica eventually. This was just a, a pilot study. So for those of you who are new, we're located right here in this yellow arrow, and this is where this uh, deployment was made. If anybody here who's new wants uh, digital files of the Tampa Bay topographic and bathymetry, let me know. And this is Egmont Key here. Uh, this is some data that the SCAMP group that Steve Morawski works or, or uh, leads uh, collected data, and the deployment somewhere in this vicinity, I don't know exactly where, but it was inland uh, from this original axis of where the strong tidal currents are. So if you happen to get a chance to go out by Egmont Key, you might want to look for this uh, big tall pole that sticks up. It's, I think, about uh, a few meters above the water, and it goes all the way to the bottom. But back to the reunion. Imagine yourself in a room with all the people who are influential in your life as an undergraduate and as a graduate student and, and so forth. And you get a chance to see them all at the same time, which was uh, pretty close to what happened. Uh, when I was at the uh, reunion, uh, Bruce Leindyke, Tanya Atwater, and Steve Miller from Santa Barbara were there, who played a, an important role as an undergraduate. And at Scripps, uh, John Orcutt, Bob Parker, David Samuel, and John Slater were there. And it was a lot of fun to just get up and acknowledge uh, their impact and their, my appreciation. Uh, there were some alumni as well. Those that have grayed out, unfortunately, have passed away, and those in white couldn't make it. So John Slater uh, told me that he thought the two most important, or two important additions to play tectonic theory were back arc basins, the understanding of how they work, and propagating rifts. Uh, the back arc basins was a, uh, uh, Alumni from Scripps, uh, Daniel Kerrig, uh, pushed that forward, and Richard Hay pushed forward the propagating rifts idea. Now, if you do a quick Google search, you'll find that plate tectonics has quite a large number of publications, almost half a million. If you look at seafloor spreading, it's about 130,000 publications, and propagating rifts is catching up slowly, about 1,900 and 900. It's probably about uh, a little bit more than that now. So how did it all begin? Well, back in 1961, Raff and Mason published this map of magnetic anomalies off the west coast of North America from Cape Mendocino on up to Canada. And it showed this beautiful zebra stripe pattern, which later on, Vine and Matthews were able to show at Iceland and then later here, that these are magnetic isochrons that represent seafloor spreading with symmetrical magnetic anomalies from the center red color, which would be the spreading center. And based on the theory that was put forward by Hess and others that talked about ridges and transform faults, they labeled this as a, a transform fault. But they observed all these oblique features that they didn't understand. How, why is a transform fault not orthogonal? Why is it so oblique? And this was left as a mystery, at least for a little while. And along came uh, Richard Hay and his friend here in the Galapagos Islands in about the mid-70s. And he was working with Jason Morgan to do a, a plate tectonic reconstruction. Now, Jason Morgan was not at this reunion, but Dan McKenzie was. And Dan McKenzie and Bob Parker published one of the first papers on plate tectonic theory. And Jason Morgan published uh, at the same time. Richard Hay was working with uh, Jason Morgan to look at the three plates around this triple junction, the Pacific, Nazca, and Cocos Plate triple junction. And in addition to that, there was this large high amplitude magnetic anomaly zone that he was investigating, looking at magnetic anomalies. One needs uh, 
determine the spreading rates to determine the plate motions, and so studying magnetic anomalies is uh, the obvious thing to do to get those rates. Now, in the equator, the spreading center runs east-west, and so a normal polarity magnetic anomaly is actually a negative anomaly, the way the, the magnetic field adds up at the sea surface. And what they notice is that these magnetic anomalies lined up perfectly straight, and the same symmetrical pair on the other side lined up perfectly straight. But in between these two areas, the anomalies did not line up. Something changed in which the spreading center no longer was one long spreading center, but now had become two. Now, if one thinks about spreading as a schematic block model of two green rigid blocks moving apart and a warmer material rising to fill the void and create new seafloor, why in the world would it turn into something like this, where you would crack a new plate boundary here in this rigid plate and turn this off where it's already warm and, and weak. So he continued to analyze the magnetic anomalies. And this is the region I just showed you, but he looked down here where Vogt published some magnetic anomalies in 74, and all these blue lines show correlations, and all these red lines down below show other correlations. And they're offset. And so he went and measured each of these profiles, and I'll show you those profiles on the next slide. Starting from the far east, working his way west, he showed this large uh, symmetrical anomaly pattern along the mid-ocean ridge. As he went further west, the anomaly pattern got shorter and shorter to the point where it was just a small little blip. So that spreading axis was spreading for a longer time period here to the east, but as you got further to the west, it had only been spreading for a short while. In addition to that, he observed a previous spreading center, which was very close to where the new one started. And over time, he would see that it was getting farther and farther away from where the new spreading center jumped. And you can see this symmetrical anomaly about this failed rift. So to put this, these results into a, a table, he looked at the time of the rift jump, three million years before present, was fur, further in the east. And as you move further west, the time of the rift jump became less and less. If one looks at the distance of the jump, starting in the east and moving west, the distance got greater and greater. And taking these two plots together and combining them in terms of time of the jump versus distance of the jump, the longer the, uh, I mean, the further west you moved, the greater the distance the jump occurred. And so the oldest jumps had the smallest distance, and the most recent jumps had the longest distance. Well, that's kind of hard to visualize and follow along, so let me just show you a schematic of what's really going on. There's a ridge that's oriented in this direction that is growing in length towards the south or down the page, but it's in a different direction than this spreading center. And so by its growth, the transform fault continues to get larger and larger. And the way this growth is shown in this schematic image is that it's spreading for a while, then it just all of a sudden jumps ahead and then starts spreading a transform fault here. Everything else here becomes inactive. And this process is repeated. It jumps ahead. After some spreading occurred to create the green, it jumps across. And then the transform fault is here. So this transform fault is slowly migrating down the page. If you let this spread and create some yellow, it then jumps again into the, the, down the page. In repeating this process over and over again, you can see the staircase pattern shows a general V-shaped pattern. If you make these time periods smaller and smaller, you get what's called a, a continuous propagating of pattern. And these V-shaped patterns are what Hay called pseudo-faults, because they're not really a fault. They're just really marking the position of where the tip of this propagating rift was. So it's a, a boundary that defines the tearing open of old lithosphere and where there should be connecting a transform fault. Oh, I forgot the other part. This dashed line 
is the rift that was spreading has failed. And so you can see the symmetric anomalies, yellow and yellow, blue and blue. So everything on this side would have been on the plate to the left, but was transferred over to the plate on the right. So Hay took this uh, discovery at the Galapagos and went back to this image at Juan de Fuca and realized that these oblique features are most likely pseudopods. And so working with Doug Wilson, uh, who's at Santa Barbara now, but was previously at Stanford, I believe, and elsewhere, uh, I forget exactly where they did this work, but they, it might have been at the University of Hawaii, I, I'm not sure if you were there at that time. No. In any case, this uh, spreading ridge here, he modeled with a computer program that showed spreading and propagation. And he made a nice flip book and a movie, and I recommend you go to his website, which is shown here. And you can actually run this movie directly from his website. And it shows how these things grow and propagate and create a similar pattern that was observed in the magnetics. So what does this mean? The propagating rifts appear that one of the primary mechanisms for rift jumps to occur and to change in orientation of a spreading center. Jumps and orientation changes. And you can see that the position of the failed rift and the pseudofault, the distance increases because this rift is propagating away. If they were parallel and they weren't changing directions, this would be parallel features. So, rather than a rift jump occurring from this warm material jumping into some cold material, what he discovered was it's actually warm material migrating into old lithosphere and cracking open in that material. And so it's not a jump from here to here as much as it's a jump from here down the page. So, in the late 60s, Atwater and Menard proposed a, a, a process to allow spreading, rate, uh, spreading directions to change by rotation of the spreading ridge. And so they assigned asymmetric spreading here and here to allow the ridge to reorient from here into this pattern here. And it creates a characteristic pattern left behind in the magnetic anomalies. Hay applied the propagating rift model to the same type of change in plate motion and observed a different type of magnetic anomaly pattern that would result from that process. And they went to sea to test it. And the place they went to was in the North Pacific, in a place where the magnetic anomalies, anomaly 25 is in this orientation, anomaly 20 is in this orientation. And in between the two, plate motion changed. Oops. The problem with this pointer is it's right next to where the slides are. Okay, go back here. So right in here, they did some surveys. That's hard to see these lines, but they cut across where the change would have occurred. And after anal analyzing all the data, C-beam, multi-beam data, and magnetics, they observed that the majority of the changes in plate motion was better described by the propagating rift hypothesis. Atwater continued to do a large analysis of the entire uh, Pacific plate and showed propagating rifts throughout that process since then. That was published in the DNAG volumes uh, in the 1990, I believe. So if you ever have an assignment from your major professor asking you to do some homework, we were assigned some fun trigonometry uh, assignment here. And we just did this for fun, but it turned out to be a table in a publication that we published in JGR in 1986. And what these equations represent is the orientation of the magnetic lineations, failed rift, the pseudo faults, based on the rate of propagation versus the rate of spreading. The propagation is fast with respect to spreading. The pseudo faults will be very close, very uh, sharp angle. If this propagation rate is really slow, it will be a wide angle. And if propagation stops, the pseudo fault becomes a transform fault. OK, now taking a look at the magnetic anomalies predicted by, this equation, by these equations, you would expect this pattern. And measurements that were made at sea during 82 and 86 found these type of magnetic anomalies that had some similarity with that. So there was some encouragement that this actually was occurring. It was published by Miller and Hay. Now, what Hay realized, there was a, a discoveries in the early 80s that overlapping spreading centers existed on the East Pacific rise, which were two ridge tips overlapping rather than forming a transform fault. 
they maintained that geometry, which he realized had to be formed by shared spreading on the two limbs, and they would have to propagate about each other to maintain that uh, non-transformed geometry. And so he realized that for propagation, a similar thing probably occurs, such that it takes time for a new spreading center to go up to full spreading rate. Here it's zero, and here it's at the rate it should be spreading. Likewise, the dying rift should take some time to turn off. And so that creates an active shear zone. And this is a prediction that was made. And this was fun because th these predictions were made before going out to survey the area. And the uh, hypothesis was there should be distributed shear in this region. And one of the things that led them to this idea was Roger Searle had gone and mapped with Gloria in 83, I believe it was, this propagating rift. So here's a, a 95 west. There's some kind of triangular feature in the Gloria data. This high backscatter means strong returns, which means probably lava flows, recent lava flows. And then there's all these kind of modeled features here that look like abyssal hill fabric. But it's hard to see exactly what's going on. So the next survey, which they did with the uh, sea beam, well, I'll show that in a second, was going to test to see if the abyssal hill fabric stayed in this orientation or if it changed direction. Because if there's a transform fault jumping through here, it should shear them into this orientation. But it wasn't clear uh, how that would happen. You would have to see some kind of evidence of some up and down the page transform faults that are left behind in this overlap zone. The other alternative hypothesis was the abyssal hill fabrics themselves act like a bunch of books that when you put a sh them under a shear couple, they rotate in this manner, and a transform fault never needs to form. It's just the abyssal hill fabric is accommodating this transform shear. This is Richard Hay aboard the cruise, uh, went to map this, as uh, provided by Ken McDonald, and this is what they came up with. First of all, there were no nor up and down transform faults in this region. So clearly, this is propagating west and leaving behind uh, what looks like curved abyssal hill fabric oriented in a new direction, just like we expected with the magnetics. Secondly, well, I've just mentioned that. So the third thing was, Hay was always in, uh, like to collaborate with others and get their feedback. So he sent this to Dan McKenzie, who's a very uh, bright scientist. And when he looked at these warm, let me show you what this is. You know, you see warm colors represent shallow depths. The cooler colors re represent deeper depths. So the tip of the propagating rift is deep. The failing spreading center is uh, off here in these little basins. So when the rates slow down, you get a little bit deeper spreading depths. And so when Mackenzie looked at all these patterns and colors, he came up, this is what he saw. A bunch of equations, OK? <laughs> and uh, he, all these equations define, it was fun to show this at that reunion, because Dan Mackenzie was in the audience when he saw this. And these equations defined these uh, uh, isochrons and the way they curved and so forth. He even labeled some things called uh, inner dying stiffening, outer dying stiffening. Uh, that term represents the time it takes for spreading to start to go to full rate. So this is kind of an exciting uh, outcome of this. Um, one of the students in our lab, M Marty Kleinrock, wrote a, a, a response to this paper because he discovered there was a mistake. I, I thought it would have been just as easy to contact Dan McKenzie directly. But he went ahead and submitted a paper, and McKenzie replied, yes, you're right. I, I had a, a typo in my equation. So you can get publications out of just catching mistakes sometimes. <laughs> These are the epicenters of earthquakes in the 95 propagating west area. And it's really fascinating because all the expectations were that earthquakes would be at the tip of this propagating rift trying to crack into this old atmosphere. But in reality, the majority of the earthquakes were in this active shear zone which makes sense if you think of all these abyssal hill faults rotating and slipping along their individual faults. So Marty Kleinrock, working in this area, published three papers. Uh, John Slater wanted me to mention the publication records out of the lab to uh, encourage the students who were attending to do the same. So he published three papers from this work. Uh, we looked at photographs on the shear zone. Uh, you could see that instead of intact rock bodies, everything was torn up and shredded and left these big talus piles, which also suggest active deformation in that region. 
And so this is the final interpretation, is that you have these active boundaries in red of the failing rift. The black lines here represent the uh, failed rifts. These two black lines are the pseudofaults, and this is the rift that's propagating, and this is a transform zone. And this transform zone is like a meat grinder. It basically is capturing material that was trying to go north and transferring it down to this plate here. So in the models that were proposed back in 82, the only one that seems to work is this transform shear model. Uh, we were very fortunate when we were at Scripps to apply for grants from ONR to uh, create a wax model. This is the model that we built at Scripps based on the Oldenburg and Brune concept that they published back in the early 70s. And this is uh, Brian Taylor, Richard Hay, Marty Kleinrock, and uh, David uh, Sandwell taking pictures. And we had to drill holes in the paddles because they were so heavy, they were bending, and so that made them lighter. We were all kind of doing this on the fly. When we got to uh, USF, we built these, uh, a much bigger tank, and it's much more rigid and works much uh, better than the previous tank. Uh, John Slater wanted me to show some videos of this, and I, I have them at the end of my talk, so I will move ahead. So we've talked about propagating rifts on the small scale, but how about on the large scale? We've been talking about offsets of the ridge tips about uh, 30 kilometers, but what happens when it's 300 kilometers? Well, this is a good time for me to enter grad school because my uh, Richard Hayes said, I have a project in the South Pacific. Would you like to go? And I said, yes. <laughs> so this is Richard Hay with one of the Moais, and that's him on the right supporting me as a grad student. And <laughs> moving forward, we collected a lot of data around the Eastern Microplate. And his, his idea was this must be a big propagating rift system that had a failed rift that would go off this direction. But in mapping the region, we discovered that the ridge actually curved back in and formed what looked like an enclosed microplate, which had been proposed by Ellen Heron in 1972 based on the pattern of earthquakes that looked like they made a big circle. Remember in the transform shear zone, all the earthquakes were in the center of that active transform zone, but here they circle around the zone, suggesting that the interior of the plate is now behaving like a rigid body. I uh, contoured and put together, this is back in the days when you used pencils and large sheets of paper, because <laughs> I'm dating myself, and we had some computers that generated some of the numbers that we contoured, but nonetheless uh, created this large bathymetry of the Easter microplate. This is Easter Island, and we can see a yellow wedge here. It looks like this eastern rift has been propagating northward into a very deep zone, like we saw at 95 west, we the rift tip was deep. This goes so deep it gets down to 6,000 meters deep. The region here is about 2,000 meters deep, and so this